patent. Then one tends to uh, withhold further investigations and perhaps if bilirubinary is, is the outcome of this child, then there is a delay in the reference. So that is the point I would like to make on ultrasound. And HIDA, the other thing is, uh, I, I prefer priming the patient with phenobarbitone for three or five days to uh, uh, effectively judge the outcome of the HIDA. And HIDA has got two components, that's the hepatic immunodiacetic acid. And I, uh, you know, it has two components, one is the hepatic uptake and the excretion. So if the uptake is poor, then the interpretation of the excretion may not be correct. And that suggests that maybe there may be a liver disease which is ongoing uh, along with a further problem. But if the uptake is good, the hepatic extraction fraction is good, and the, uh, you know, empty of the intestine is not seen after 24 hours, then it rings an alarm bell again in my mind saying that this could be uh, an obstructive element to the bile duct, which and bilirubin arteries is the most likely diagnosis under such circumstances, and then a intraoperative cholangiogram is warranted. Right. So, uh, ultrasound gallbladder not seen is a good sign. It tells us that there may be an obstruction. But one thing that we need to remember is do an ultrasound on a fasting stomach. If we are going to do ultrasound after the child has had a meal, the gallbladder is going to be contracted and it's not going to be seen. So that is one aspect that we need to remember. And second, if the HIDA uptake itself is poor, then we cannot rely on the reports of no excretion. So we need to interpret and then maybe we need to go, as he said, for an intraop cholangiogram. Now, uh, Dr. Alka Jada, we are doing a gamut of tests. What possible etiologies are we trying to rule out? The possible etiologies can be classified actually into two ways. One thing is there is uh, the idiopathic which is commonest, but it is a diagnosis of exclusion. Before that, we have to have the infections and the metabolic variety, which we have to consider. And there is an entity called uh, other varieties where we have the post structural abnormalities of the liver like bilus disease, paucity of intrahepatic ducts, and syndromic and non-syndromic. So really, if you really have to look at the child, is the child looking sick? If the child is looking sick, probably the infections and metabolic diseases are still high on the list. And amongst the infections, if you really go to see statistically, of the TORC infections, the CMV infections are very high in the tune of around 60 to 64% of them will be the CMV, which will be followed by toxoplasmosis and rubella, and rarely the herpes. You know, hepatitis B, though it is known as a vertical transmission, rarely and very, very rarely presents as neonatal cholestasis syndrome. So please really, before considering hepatitis as a cause for the neonatal cholestasis, consider, think of 10 times before you really say it. In our conditions, actually, situation, we definitely see uh, malarial hepatitis also presenting as neonatal cholestasis of, in a sick child up to three months, especially when there is history of fever with chills and rigors in the mother. We must really consider that as far as the infections are concerned. These are the commoner infections which we really come across. When we go to the metabolic liver diseases, presenting really as a, probably they present, the galactosemia is the commonest presentation. And this galactosemia, the children, they really have the vomiting, poor feeding, maybe there is a convulsion, a history of convulsions, and uh, we really look at it. But then we have uh, 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 this one, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which will also be presenting like this in the metabolic diseases. And rarely we have neonatal hemochromatosis presenting with us. And the structural anomalies. And amongst the biliary atresia, what we have is something like biliary atresia-like thing, which, will, which is called as inspissated bile syndrome or the inspissated plug, which will also... Pre this is about the biliary atresia. In hepatitis, we will be presenting this way. Okay. These are the conditions which we would be thinking. Right. So we are looking at obstructive causes, biliary atresia, cholidocal cyst. We are looking at hepatic causes of which infections are the major torch group of infections, VDRL. Uh, metabolic causes like galactosemia, alpha-1 antitrypsin, genetic causes as was pointed out and storage disorder. Dr. Rekar, can you tell us uh, something about biliary atresia and also about cholidocal cysts. What are these conditions? Uh, I could tell you, but it will take the whole day. <laughs> in uh, short, in brief. Right. Well, uh, biliary atresia is an obliterative uh, uh, disorder of the bile ducts. Uh, where there is destruction of the bile ducts, the etiology is not very clear. There are a variety of uh, factors thought of as causing that, including of late autoimmune uh, issues. 
uh, but effectively we land up with a situation where the child is known to have uh, complete obliteration of the extrahepatic bile ducts, including sometimes intrahepatic. There are a variety of types of biliary atresia yeah? and uh, uh, the, the diagnosis has to be made fairly quickish, less than two months if possible and a surgical treatment of a portoenterostomy is warranted. Actually, we need to explore these children, find out and confirm the diagnosis of uh, blocked ducts and then give a outlet to the, uh, you know, blocked ducts. So, you give the outlet to the liver for uh, the bile to come out into the intestines. So, that is called Kasai's portoenterostomy, described by Murio Kasai from Sendai in Japan in 1959. Uh, the outcomes of patients with biliary atresia about, uh, I've been doing literature search, but worldwide with a native liver, about 40 to 50 percent of the patients uh, are known to do well in institutes that cater to biliary atresia, while the others may need liver transplantations or if they don't get transplanted, children die by about two years of age. So that's in short about biliary atresia. A colidical cyst is the dilatation of the bile duct. It is an abnormal dilatation of the bile duct. Uh, uh, essentially, there are various types of colidocal cysts. Uh, they have been described as cystic, fusiform, diverticulum, colidocosils, and intrahepatic and extrahepatic colidocal cysts. So, the etiology for these are due to perhaps uh, the, the commonest concept is that there is a reflux of pancreatic juice into the bile duct, causing uh, uh, you know, abnormal uh, action of the pancreatic juice on the bile ducts and causing dilatation. Uh, presentation could be with jaundice, could be with abdominal pain or could be with uh, you know clay colored stools or, but most of the children may uh, present with no symptoms at all, just the identification on ultrasound abdomen when it is done. So it can be a chance finding also. Uh, Colidocal cysts have to be surgically treated by excision and doing a Ruamai anastomosis. Is that enough or you would want yeah, more? I think that's uh, quite a uh, concise uh, summary of uh, biliary atresia and colidocal cysts. This is for uh, people who are uh, just new to the field of uh, hepatobiliary uh, in children. Biliary atresia has been very well defined as obliteration of the bile ducts and colidocal cysts as dilatation of the bile ducts, both causing jaundice and or clay colored stools. Uh, we go on to the next question. Uh, how would you screen for medical causes? So what is this gamut of tests that we are going to do apart from liver function tests, HIDA and uh, ultrasound? What are the other tests that we are going to do in these children? Okay, the other tests we will re definitely like to do is we will start with the, we start with the intrauterine infections which is still the commonest cause for the neonatal cholestasis syndrome. So depending on the age of the child, we have to investigate the child and the mother both. You know, if the child is less than three months of age, we definitely do the IgM or torch panel only the IgM titers. If the IgM is positive for CMV, toxoplasma, rubella, then obviously he is intrauterine infection. But beyond three months of age, we have to do the IgG, IgM as well as IgG up to six months of life. And if he is, and IgG titers have to be corresponded with the IgG titers in the mother. If the child's titers are more than the maternal titers, we definitely take it as intrauterine infections related to, because sometimes the IgM will become negative by three months and the IgG will be positive. So simultaneous documentation of maternal IgG titers of the same conditions, we should be doing it. So this is about it. About the metabolic screen, so we really have to look at the child. In a sick looking child, definitely we will do the pre-feeding blood sugar. Uh, pre-feeding blood sugar level, we do the, uh, if the child is being fed, then we do the urine for reducing substances. And in this urine for reducing substances, we do it by Benedict's method because the regular screening test with glucose oxidase method will definitely give a false negative test for screening for galactosemia. Then we will do the serum protein electrophoresis, uh, then alpha fetoproteins. Sometimes alpha fetoproteins are falsely uh, elevated even in neonatal hepatitis. So if it is elevated, it gives us an indication that maybe it is neonatal hepatitis. And, uh, okay, then this is about the, we look at the child's condition and do the fundus examination for cataracts, chorioretinitis. We look at the heart to do whether there is a murmur, there are some dysmorphic phases. And uh, after all these investigations, uh, urine for succinyl acetone to rule out tyrosinemia. 
and uh, with all these investigations we try to definitely locate him in case he is fitting into inborn error of metabolism serum ferritin levels in case of neonatal hemochromatosis these are the possible other. anything yeah so uh, apart from obstructive causes which while we are doing to go into do ultrasound hida there are certain metabolic and uh, infective causes that one needs to rule out so a torch titer is something that really needs to be done in these patients uh, along with the torch titer obviously the hearing and the ophthal needs to be done so that we can pick up chorioretinitis and deafness 2d echo is very essential because allergies may present with pulmonary stenosis so this is one thing that needs to be uh, done in all patients with neonatal cholestasis and galactosemia as dr alka jado pointed out we need to do by the benedict test pick up reducing substances and if it's positive it's an emergency run again uh, dr suda sane you've been a passive observer for this entire session till now uh, but we come to the main and the most controversial point of the entire session and the session is on liver biopsy now uh, when should liver biopsy be done in these patients and why is it required actually for a medical causes as dr jadhav has explained most of the diagnosis can be done on investigations so invasive procedure like liver biopsy is not required it may be useful for supportive diagnosis say in cases of infection uh, to confirm toxoplasmosis or cmv or like that uh, for surgical causes or obstructive causes biopsy is required intraoperatively to Uh, see the size of bile ducts and uh, confirm or for a prognosis of the uh, operation the biopsy neonate for a such all diseases is confusing and depends interpretation depends on pathologist most of the cases show uh, giant cell hepatitis and giant cell formation is a non specific Uh, response of neonatal hepatocyte to any type of injury so it is very difficult to these causes unless one finds the causative factor like uh, causative agent like cmv or toxoplasma or uh, obstructive factor like uh, bile plugs in the bile ducts or so right so uh, the question is uh, would you recommend doing a liver biopsy for a diagnosis of biliary atresia versus non biliary atresia uh, no because a uh, in biopsy its picture varies according to time of the uh, disease or what is the age of the child and uh, many of the features are overlapping in both things so for a diagnosis or differentiation of these two conditions it is very difficult to differentiate unless one has a follow up so we have uh, dr sudha sane herself a pathologist saying that liver biopsy doing as a diagnostic procedure is extremely confusing is dependent on the pathologist who is reporting the slide there are overlapping pictures giant cell hepatitis will be common to both uh, dr ray what do you have to say for that now we going into the controversy well i think uh, it's the degree of confidence that the medical or the surgical team have in their histopathologist uh, there are institutes where instead of hida scan liver biopsy is done as a pre pre operative test so hida scan is not done at kings and uh, only on the basis of liver biopsy they would diagnose but then with that also there were hits and miss many people were explored thinking it is biliary atresia and it wasn't biliary atresia so i would entirely agree with dr sudha sane that biliary uh, this uh, liver biopsies in the early periods are extremely difficult to comment on and to be uh, sure and say that this is biliary atresia or not biliary atresia but as we know now most of the tests are like that so the surest test according to me and me being a surgeon i might be having a surgical bias but the surest test according to me is having a look inside and do it an intraoperative colangiography if necessary because with a look inside we can uh, definitely identify whether the bile ducts are red or not and then proceed if necessary so on what basis would you decide to do an intraoperative but if everything is pointing to a child with direct jaundice and there are markers saying that there is no exit of the bile into the gut in 24 hours time especially on the hida scan 
when I have low threshold in exploring this child. And I don't mind if the laparotomy is negative. At least we are sure that the liver is not going to be damaged in the future due to obstructive reasons. Right. So, uh, markers of obstructive jaundice. Uh, direct jaundice, child with clay colored stools, either showing a good uptake but no excretion. These are all markers that this may be an obstructive cause and we need not wait and we just go ahead with an intraoperative angiogram. Dr. Sudha Sane has pointed out there are limitations of liver biopsy. And in fact, if we do it first, we may miss the disease. Uh, we are going to present a case later about a child with evolving biliary atresia. So suppose this child came to me at two months and I did a liver biopsy. It's not necessary that it may pick up biliary atresia. The disease may evolve over a period of time. So liver biopsy as the first test may have its limitations. But if you have a pathologist like Dr. Sudha Sane, you can just go ahead and do a liver biopsy and you'll get a diagnosis. Now, there have been consensus reports of the